Hello, everybody. I want to um, uh, start this conference off. And um, right now, uh, Professor Kotlikoff has had a, a little sh soldier, uh, shoulder uh, surgery a week ago, and he's healing from that. And he just came back from a trip. And um, we had a, the usual last minute technology problems, but uh, we've pretty much ironed them out and uh, our numbers are growing here and all is good. Um, so I'm, we're at 404, we've got time. Um, I would just wanna thank everybody who's, who's helped with this conference. Um, all the AFJM people, I wanna especially thank Hobart and uh, Sue and uh, uh, Sue Peters and Jerry Perry for helping getting several uh, uh, speakers and uh, everybody else who's helped in some way with this conference. Uh, this conference is a huge team effort. I think it's one of the most important conferences for uh, people who are concerned about the future and are now looking for calm ways to go about into an uncertain future. And um, I hope us, and we're all uh, compadres, or we all, we're all brothers and sisters in that movement. And um, it's an important time in that regard. And uh, we'll say more things. I will say that we have around 31 speakers. It's a very, very diverse group of people over this weekend. It's more than a thousand minutes of presentation time, and it's very valuable for everyone, I believe. It's, um, uh, and, and we'll say things, and, but there's a lot of diversity in the speakers and in the participants. And um, so I, I hope one of my goals to see from this is a lot of cross -fertiliz fertilization of ideas. And um, I think one of the benefits of a Congress, a conference like this, is people getting and seeing new and different ideas. And we're going to see a lot of that just tonight. We have um, three very interesting speakers, and and we're we're going to absorb three different perspectives on how to move the monetary movement forward. And um, and it, it'll be it'll be great. And during the conference, we'll get into topics. We'll talk about things in a little more depth together. But right now, I want to turn it over to Hobart Schuller, who's going to introduce Professor Kotlikoff. Uh, thank you, Hobart. We're using the uh, microphone of Stephen. We're, ne we're sitting next to each other here uh, as co-hosts and co-organizers of this uh, uh, really exciting conference. Uh, as Steve already said, it's quite <laughs> diverse. Um, we will start with um, Professor Kotlikov, and I'll give a, a little introduction to him. And because at this conference, uh, we came to a formula to give people 20 minutes and then 10 minutes for question and answer, we keep introductions very short. Uh, and we'll send people to the conference page where you will find other information about our speakers and also links to their books or other interesting material that they have. And you can go from there. Um, I will also give some uh, rules of the road um, in, for these uh, meetings. Uh, it's specifically about um, gathering and posing questions to our uh, speakers. So, while we, you know, the speaker is speaking, um, you know, think about something, write it down, um, either put it in the chat, or when we get into the question and answer meeting, uh, you can raise your hands, which is one of the items you can do under reactions at the bottom of your screen, where you can, uh, there's a button reactions, and then there is a thing called raise your hand, which I'm doing now. And then you can also lower it again. That will be an indication you have a question. Um, also with those questions, please keep it short because we only have 10 minutes uh, uh, to do uh, uh, our exchange. 
Um, and please do not chat uh, during the presentation um, for both the moderator and the presenter. That could be a little bit of a distraction. We rather not have that. Though on the other side, if you want to chat uh, in a private capacity, uh, uh, do as you like, um, of course. So that's a little bit about the rules of the road. So let's go to introducing Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff. And uh, we are very excited to have him here. He, he, we invited him and he jumped on the uh, occasion right away to, um, to do this and claims a good block of time uh, for his message. Um, and we'll get to that. First of all, he is uh, Professor of Economics at Boston University. And he has written, and I, I can show it like this, Jimmy Stewart is dead, ending the world's ongoing financial plague with limited purpose banking. And limited purpose banking is his, um, let's say, concept for how to change the, uh, the system. And that's exactly the title of his presentation. <laughs> and it's really a good title fixing the financial system for good and that's of course a double entendre uh <laughs> maybe forever but for the good of uh humanity let's let's say it like that it's not just for america but we're 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 thinking and this this conference has many very serious thoughts uh you know at a global scale but we get to that uh, later um we can just start Four minutes earlier, we have now 47 people uh, online. We have about over 100 that have registered. We had some problems with registration and our apologies for that. We put in some uh, not very uh, functional links in some of our emails. Uh, but if you have people that want to join, um, we just sent another email to everybody that registered online uh, with the Zoom links. So you should be able to, um, to um, participate. So without further ado, uh, as I said, let's keep the introduction short. I give the floor to Professor Kotlikov. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. Um, let's hear it, how we can change the system for good. Okay, well, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, Gover, maybe you could just uh, tell me how long I should talk for because uh, uh, being a professor, I could talk forever. And uh, I'm <laughs> sure that's not what you had in mind, so. Um, up to an hour and we can do a half an hour of question and answer. But if you want to do it shorter, we can say 40 minutes and then maybe 20 minutes uh, question and answer. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll target for like the top of the hour to start maybe responding with Q and A and we'll see how how long that goes. The, um, that sounds good. Um, so like all of you, I kind of, you know, sat through the uh, 2008 financial crisis. I didn't know too much about the financial system at, the, at that time. And I started thinking about it. I had a pretty good mentor named Perry Merling who was visiting uh, Boston University's economics department at my invitation. So every day we would, um, Look at the financial uh, headlines together, and uh, and uh, you know look at a different uh, data series about what was going on, and discuss um, his perspective and my perspective. And the um, anyway, it was clear we were having a financial uh, meltdown. We had in two thousand and uh, and eight, I think, seventeen large financial institutions either failed or were, uh, uh, you know, went bankrupt. That was Lehman, of course, uh, but most did not, I don't think any other ones went bankrupt. They were uh, bailed out by the federal government, either in the form of uh, nationalization, if you're talking about Fannie Mae and Fre Freddie Mac, and, uh, or in the form of uh, shotgun weddings, if you're talking about like Merrill Lynch or Bear Stearns, where the Federal Reserve obviously played a big role in uh, organizing that shotgun wedding with uh, J.P. Morgan. And there was some nationalization in the sense that uh, the Federal Reserve um, of New York uh, bought up some of the um, supposedly worst uh, uh, subprime mortgages that uh, Bear Stearns had on its books. Um, 
I had a, a, a I have a brother, a former brother-in-law uh, since become divorced, but we're still in touch. He was a uh, one of the uh, 200 or so bankers who went into from J.P. Morgan who went into Bear Stearns that weekend on the Friday to figure out by Sunday what uh, J.P. Mor what uh, Bear Stearns was worth, and so they looked at all the books. And I asked him whether he had any idea before they went into um, in, into the uh, into their building and took a look at what was going on in the books what uh, Bear Stearns was up to. Did anybody from JP Morgan have any idea of what their assets were, what the liabilities, what their, you know, what's really in their, in their books? He said, no idea. I said, at the end of the weekend, did any of you guys have any idea? He said, no idea. So, uh, so one of the big things that hit me uh, during this period was that we were, we had a, a huge amount of uh, uh, opacity in the banking system that nobody knew uh, really what the financial system was, uh, what any individual financial intermediary was investing in, what they really owed, what the assets were really worth. Uh, I have a friend, uh, her name is Janet Yellen. She's the current treasury secretary, uh, former chairman of the Federal Reserve. And when she was, I think, vice chairman, uh, uh, we had uh, dinner down in Washington and I was, um, we talked a bit about the financial system and she was kind of expressing to me uh, how much, how little the Fed really understood even to this, to the point we we're having dinner, you know, that evening, <laughs> uh, even though we were um, really several years after the, the financial crisis that the, uh, the financial system is very complicated and uh, it's, it's really hard for the Federal Reserve to, or any uh, government institution to really have a 100% handle on what's going on. So you're gonna have uh, like an LTCM, long-term capital management, have an enormous hedge position where they're investing in on the money, long-term treasuries, and shorting off the money treasuries or whatever they did, they maybe they did the opposite of that, shorted the other ones and went along the off the money. Uh, and then a small thing like Russia defaults on its uh, official debt. And all of a sudden this gap that they were sure was gonna narrow widens. And in 10 seconds, they're uh, in effect in bankruptcy and you have huge amounts of uh, leverage. And then they had borrowed from the major banks in New York because the major banks were sure that um, if we're talking about, you know, Bob Merton and Myron Scholes, two Nobel laureates in, in economics and finance, and Bob Merton is probably the most famous finance economist of all time. Uh, certainly has done the most fundamental work in finance not just the you know, fundamental work in, in the Black-Scholes option pricing formula, but just in general, um, in all kinds of topics. Uh, they, these banks put their faith in uh, these folks and, uh, and their associates who also had uh, you know, stellar reputations, I think, to a large extent. And so they're kind of like trusting Jimmy Stewart to be an honest, uh, uh, careful banker, and I'm not saying there, were, there was any dishonesty of any kind here, uh, but there was trust. And then uh, if you've watched uh, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and I'm sure most of you folks have watched that Christmas movie in which Jimmy Stewart plays the uh, honest banker, and he is honest, but there is some something that happens, and there's some, uh, you know, there's some theft actually by an, uh, a banker, a dishonest banker in the town. And all of a sudden the, the confidence is lost and the, the uh, entire town was banking on Jimmy Stewart uh, because nobody knew the assets and liabilities of this particular bank in, a, in this particular made up town. Uh, I forget the name of the town, something, uh, something falls, Bedford Falls, I think was the name of the town. So all the trust resided in one person. And uh, 
that's where I came up with the title, Jimmy Stewart is Dead of this book, which I recommend that you all take a look at because uh, it's a fun read, I think. Uh, and the point was that uh, we don't have a lot of Jimmy Stewart's around. Uh, people lost trust instantaneously in uh, Merton and Scholes that, you know, if they'd waited a week or two, uh, the, the position probably would have righted itself and long-term capital management might still be in business and doing just, just fine. But there was, um, you know, nobody, nobody really understood their position. They announce a huge loss. Nobody really understands the nature of the, what was going on. And now you have the now you have uh, potentiality of all the banks that have invested. Uh, people starting start questioning whether they have the uh, assets to sustain their liabilities to cover the liabilities. And you have the classic kind of bank run, or and the the classic bank run is depositors running on banks. More recently, we've had banks running on banks. That's what we had in two thousand eight. That's what we really have had. Um, we would have had in uh, in this COVID crisis had the Fed not jumped in uh, in March 2020 in such a vigorous manner. So you, you have this, um, again, lack of opacity and you have, uh, so, so you can't look at the book, you can't go online and find out what an LTCM is holding, what it owes, what its positions are, it's all, private proprietary information. Same thing with Bear Stern, same thing with Lehman Brothers. Now, uh, Christopher Cox, who was the SEC chairman at the time that uh, I think that Bear Stearns and I think Lehman went under, uh, reported and uh, testified to Congress, so I think it was when about Bear Stearns, that Bear Stearns uh, had, um, you know, in terms of a, passing a stress test, they had plenty of capital at the time that they went, went under. It's just that the valuation of their capital went to zero because nobody, the trust went out the window. Um, everybody had heard all these stories about Jimmy Kane, who was their CEO, not being a trustworthy guy. He hadn't helped bail out, bail out Bear Stearns. He wasn't one of the, the good guys on Wall Street. And he, smoked very expensive cigars and he uh, flew a helicopter to a golf course and therefore he must not be Jimmy Stewart. So, so there, uh, from one day to, you know, from a, you know, a month or two before it went under, Bear Stearns stock went from way up here, like $200 a share to $2 a share uh, over that weekend when the deal was struck with Jimmy, JP Morgan to buy up the bank for less than the building was worth. Okay, this was a bank that I think was founded in like 1834 or something, it's the old, maybe the oldest uh, bank in our country uh, that went poof over, over a weekend. So it, it got me, I'm, I'm not really a, a, a banking guy uh, or you know, a money guy, I'm a macro kind of a public finance uh, economist and worked also in macro and growth and uh, personal finance, um, it, it got me thinking, uh, gee, uh, what's, what's really going on here? And so I wrote this book and I focused on the financial sector. I know this is the Monetary Institute and I know that we're kind of focused on, you folks are focused on money and what is really money and how does money connect to the financial system uh, and it certainly plays a, a role in it, but it's not, uh, I think there are some distinctions between, you know, you can have a financial system that's uh, much more elaborate than just people uh, swapping uh, chickens for seashells uh, at, the sea, at the seashore. So we will talk, I uh, hope, um, about money and, you know, uh, what I, think money really is and, and what kind of a financial, you know, where money is playing a role in the financial system and our, you know, the inflation that we have, is it being generated by the Fed? We've had all this uh, creation of money by the, by the Federal Reserve in the last um, 
since 2008, high power money has gone up by a factor of six. Is that, you know, you know, if Milton Friedman were alive, would he say that we should have an increase in the price level of a factor of six um, or more because the velocity of money, the speed at which it circulates has fallen in half uh, relative to its historic value. So we could have, you know, if you just went back to the quantity theory, you'd say that the price level should be 12 times higher than it currently is. So uh, I hope we'll, we'll get to these um, these issues, but let me just uh, continue telling you my little story about writing this book, Jimmy Stewart is Dead. Uh, so, you know, one thing that struck me was the opacity. Uh, another thing that struck me was in thinking about the financial system is that uh, everybody was worried about the system shutting down and uh, not too many people thought about the fact that we had this the biggest bank in the world, the Federal Reserve, that could step in and take over making loans and uh, to uh, households or if need be to, to you know do whatever it wanted needed to do to to take over from failed banks. Um, but there was this concern that the banking system was going to fail and therefore the economy would fail. Now, if you look historically at the financial at the recessions that the countries had, They've been, a lot of them, most of them have coincided with financial crises. And most of those financial crises have turned on some small bit of information that changed uh, people's perceptions about basically Iran that we're going to have. Uh, so we had, um, you know, 1909, I think uh, it was, uh, maybe I think the copper market was being cornered by, I, mean, I don't recall exactly the history of each of these cases, but if you look back, there was always something that triggered, uh, that came right before uh, some big financial crash, which then led to uh, bank failures and a loss of trust and uh, around the banks. And of course, in the, in the early thirties, we had a third of the banks fail. And uh, there were some, you know, some harbingers of, of problems of uh, you know, concerns about opacity, about selling swamp land in, in Florida. There were stories about that. And then there was, uh, uh, and, and then you had, you know, historically you've had cases where the financial system has been rescued just by uh, somebody restoring trust like JP Morgan in 1909. Uh, or the Federal Reserve uh, restoring trust in 2008, although we did have a pretty major recession, although I would not call it a great recession. I think that was uh, part of what, uh, what happened in the great recession is that we started calling it great. Everybody started calling it great, Obama, McCain. Uh, and because everybody started calling it a great recession, searches for the Great Depression spiked in uh, right after Lehman went under that. If you look at the Google searches, uh, searches for the Great Depression went like crazy or spiked like crazy. Everybody thought we were going into the Great Depression and people started calling this the Great Recession even before it became any big deal recession. And if you look historically at um, how big the recession was, it wasn't so great. There was only a 3% drop in output from peak to trough. Uh, that wasn't much different from the 1981 recession. Uh, of course, that was also triggered by Volcker's um, announcing that he was gonna to target monetary aggregates, which he, of course, didn't, well, not of course, but he never actually ended up targeting, uh, never hit any of the targets, but he announced it a day late, the same day, the financial markets went crazy and within a couple of years we're in recession. But that recession was in many ways just as great as the Great Recession. The output decline, the unemployment increase went up to 10%, just like it did in 2008, 2009. So, and the stock market dropped, um, uh, well, it dropped more in the, um, in the Great Recession, but of course the stock market is not the economy. 
Uh, and so anyway, um, so I'm looking at this, I'm kind of puzzled. Uh, why do we care so much if, uh, yes, we got this opacity, yes, we have this potential for um, some little bit of information that might be misinformation, like LTCM is engaged in something inappropriate. I don't think they were, They and was this a bad trade? Probably not, um, but we have, um, you know, books written suggesting they that these folks uh, had engaged in something inappropriate. And uh, then we had, um, you know, books written about the Great Depression, uh, the Great Recession, the Big Short, uh, is I think one of the books that was written, and I think that became a movie suggesting that there was all kinds of fraud going on and that uh, uh, we had, and if you look at the federal financial, sorry, the um, Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, which was the commission that was set up to investigate uh, the causes of the Great Recession, just like there was a commission set up right after the Great Depression or in the 30s uh, to investigate the causes of the Great Depression. So the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission identified these subprime mortgages as being um, uh, one of the causes, uh, they had like 10 causes. Uh, and uh, there was excess leverage. Apparently Bear Stearns have become much more leveraged. All these different financial institutions, uh, they were not in a position to pass the stress test that's being uh, run today, although the head of the SEC said that Bear, that Bear Stearns was in a position. I think um, uh, the same thing was stated about, J about Lehman Brothers. Dick Fold testified to Congress that what happened to Lehman Brothers could have happened literally to any financial institution, including Goldman Sachs, regardless of what stress test uh, would have shown. Um, but anyway, the uh, in addition to saying it was a subprimes, in addition to saying it was um, uh, leverage, in addition to saying that it was uh, misrating of securities, in addition to saying it was government regulators that would somehow were asleep at the wheel and it was a revolving door and they weren't doing their job. Uh, in addition to saying that the housing market was uh, had gone crazy, uh, skyrocketed. Uh, so they had like 10, 10 uh, explanations. And I looked at these, at the, you know, I was listening to these at the time. And when I wrote my book, I kind of bought those explanations kind of hook, line and sinker. I said, well, gee, uh, since I don't really have the facts uh, and we were seeing this in the papers, it must be that subprime mortgages are, you know, a big deal here and that the leverage of, of Lehman and Bear Stearns is much higher and Washington Mutual and, uh, and all these institutions that went under much worse. And uh, that uh, there must've been misreading rating by the S&P and Moody's of the financial securities of the uh, these uh, tranched um, subprime assets, um, you know, they must have been mis, uh, mis appraised because the raiders were being paid to misrate the securities. Okay, so anyway, I digested all that. I took it as true. Um, I'll explain to you why I think none of it's true in a moment and, and how those to really verify that none of it's true. Uh, anyway, uh, but the, the thing that occurred to me was here we have uh, a financial industry that uh, is so um, so sensitive to misinformation and has very little information uh, and seems to be so vital as to believe, make everybody believe the economy is gonna shut down if it shuts down. So Lehman Brothers shut down and things went crazy, right? The, the um, Stock market started dropping like crazy. The Treasury Secretary went nuts. Uh, started on bended knee, begged Nancy Pelosi for seven hundred billion dollars to pass the TARP bill. Uh, uh, ben Bernanke, uh, who was the head of the, the Fed at the time, also you know was saying that this was the 
we didn't really intervene dramatically, we would have the biggest financial crisis. You know, we'd be back in the Great Depression. And he might have been right, given the institutions that we had. We might have had a run on, we had a run on 17 institutions. We could have had a run on the Rust as well. Uh, could have seen Goldman and Morgan Stanley going to go down uh, to name a couple. So um, what they did might have been the thing to do given the institution we had. But my question was, why do we have the institution we had? Why do we have uh, an institution that um, is this fragile, uh, financial intermediaries that are playing the, you know, they're not just like the Apple industry. The Apple industry had failed. We had a bad crop of apples and all the apple orchards had gone under. Well, it wouldn't have been the end of the economy. It wouldn't have caused a great recession, right? Uh, but if I'm, if I'm uh, sitting there in uh, uh, September 16th of 2008, and I start hearing about Lehman, and I hear the great, and I'm a, maybe I'm selling uh, furniture, and I've got a bunch of uh, workers, maybe it's handcrafted furniture, and I start hearing uh, everybody talking about the Great Depression happening again, what's the first thing I'm gonna do? I'm gonna fire my employees because they're my biggest liability. I have to pay them at the end of the month. So I'm gonna lay off uh, my, my most recent hires. I'm gonna keep my long-term employees, the ones who really know how to make the furniture and they can train the new guys after this problem. And I fire my guys because I think that that Joe down the street who's selling clothes in a retail store is gonna fire his employees and his employees are my customers. And Joe fires Joe's employees because he figures that I'm gonna fire my employees who are his customers. So you see the potential here for multiple equilibria for self-fulfilling prophecies. That's at the essence of a bank run. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna run in this bank because I think everybody else is gonna run in the bank. I'm not going to extend my line of credit to uh, JP, to Bear Stearns or long-term capital management in this context of a crisis because I don't think anybody else will. And I'll be stuck with um, a mess, even though I don't know for sure that it is a mess. So, uh, so why do we, you know, why is that the financial system is uh, so critical. Why is it different from the apple orchard in industry? Why is it a different uh, kettle of fish here? Well, it seems to me in thinking about it, and maybe this uh, thought process uh, reflected my coming from the world of public finance, where one of the key things we talk about in public finance is public goods. So if you, re if you get a hold of uh, Jimmy Stewart is dead, which uh, will probably cost you five bucks on Amazon. You can probably buy a used copy. If you can't you know, swing it for whatever reason, I'll send you a copy. I would pay you to read the book. Uh, don't necessarily look so much at the facts about, well, I don't really quote too many facts, and, but um, you know, I do characterize kind of what was going on or what, and, and I'm buying the story. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid about uh, Bear Stearns and so forth being over leveraged and uh, uh, the mismanaged uh, that nobody had access to Dick Fold. None of the traders knew what the other traders were doing. And that, that's true. But that's the que question is whether that's really at the heart of what caused the Great Recession. Anyway, the um, uh, so I started thinking about the financial institution system as a public good. And it occurred to me uh, I like to think in analogies. I think, think about another public good, which is the uh, highway system. And, you know, when you think about the highway system, well, clearly they've got the highways and then they're not, they're not going to disappear. But you have these financial intermediaries running the highway system and they're called the gas stations. And they're intermediating between uh, the refineries and the public. So they're getting the gasoline from the refineries, they're sell selling it to the public. And uh, they're doing this on a non-leveraged basis. They're, now, if you read uh, Jimmy Stewart is Dead, the first thing you'll do is, is read about um, my story of uh, gods, which are um, 
gas options for drivers. That's what gods stand for. So I conjure up this idea of gas stations all of a sudden uh, getting the idea from a hard, new Harvard uh, MBA that what they should do is sell options to drivers who come to the gas station, they sell the gas, but in addition, they sell a financial security that says, look, uh, we guarantee that if the price of gas ever goes above $10 a gallon, we'll sell you gas at $10 a gallon. And buy, and you, buy, you pay for the security right now, just like you're buying gas. And um, now you've bought some insurance against the, gas, the price of gas never going above, above 10 bucks. Now, suppose that every gas station in the country, and especially the ones on the highways, sold these options, sold these gods uh, to the public and it became a booming business. And then because of um, you know, some crisis in the Middle East or something, the price of gasoline goes to $20 a gallon and all these gas stations go broke because they can't make good on their, on their insurance. They've sold these options and the drivers come and say, look, uh, here's my certificate. You've got to sell me gas as much as I want at 10 bucks. And the gas station says, well, I'm broke because I have to buy it at 20 bucks and I am um, leveraged. I have an obligation. I promise to do something, to deliver something in a state of nature that I could not deliver on. And that's what I call leverage. Uh, promising to do something you know you, you can't really necessarily 100% uh, deliver on. So they sell these gods, they go under, they walk away from the gas stations with the keys to the gas pumps. And what we have then is a economic meltdown. We have an economic crisis uh, whereby the entire commerce system would, would break down. No trucks could drive on the highway system. So it would take probably about, an, uh, you know, about 15 minutes for Congress to pass a law. First of all, they have to mobilize the National Guard to take over the gas stations and get them up and running again and get the refineries to, to send the gasoline. So we'd have a while there before we had private ownership of gas stations again. But, uh, but Congress would also pass a law within 15 minutes that said gas stations cannot do anything but buy gasoline and sell it. They can't sell, they can't go into the securities business. They can't leverage themselves. If they wanna speculate on the price of gas, they can do that, but not as a function of their running their company. They've got a company, it's an entity, it's incorporated or a private company. If they wanna, as a private citizen, uh, use their checking account or brokerage account to, to buy options, put options on oil companies or whatever, uh, they can do that. They can speculate, but they can't do it through their company. You can't have um, gas stations be leveraged in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so now, once I had that in my brain, I said to myself, well, how can we make that same law apply to the financial system? How can we you know, carry that notion over the financial system? And that's where limited purpose banking came into my brain. Yeah, I remember I was driving up, um, I guess it was 95 from New York back up to Boston. And it just occurred to me that there was a way to have a financial system which could never go bankrupt, that could never fail, could never have leverage. And that's uh, limited purpose banking where you limit the banking system to its legitimate purpose, which is intermediation, which it's not gambling with the economy it's not engaging in opacity, but uh, just helping uh, lenders find borrowers and, uh, and uh, uh, helping um, the savers find uh, investors. And so if you looked at the financial system back then and look at it today, you'll notice that we have uh, equity financed mutual funds that if you incorporate if you include in that uh, the money market funds that are now, uh, uh, if we're talking about large deposit money market funds, uh, mark to market, so that it's not uh, 
money market funds that are uh, where they're where they're uh, back to some to the buck, but rather they fluctuate in value when the owners of those funds, uh, their asset, their shares fluctuate in value too. Uh, well, these uh, equity finance mutual funds, and they number about 10,000, and the number of banks in the country probably around 9,000. So we actually have more equity finance mutual funds than we do commercial and uh, you know investment banks. And these uh, uh, equity finance mutual funds, if you think about Fidelity's, uh, for example, uh, Freedom Fund, or Magellan has a Windsor Fund. So they take in money and they hand back shares and then they take the money and they invest in things. So they might invest in, um, uh, in stocks or they might invest in foreign government bonds or US government bonds. Uh, uh, if we're talking about closed end funds, mutual funds, then they take in money and they say, well, uh, the, your shares are not, we're not gonna redeem your shares overnight. Um, what we're gonna do is take your money and we're gonna invest it maybe in mortgages. We're gonna buy, with all the money that comes in, we're gonna buy 30 year mortgages or 20 year mortgages in, the, in this uh, particular part of the country. Uh, if, if we're talking about a mortgage mutual fund, I'm not sure they exist, but they certainly more or less exist in Europe in, in the covered bond market system. So um, we're gonna buy these mortgages and we're just gonna hold them to maturity. And you, the investor, are going to have the ability to change the management. Uh, but uh, basically any money comes in is gonna go to you, less the fees for running the mutual fund. And uh, uh, you're, uh, so if for example, if we're running a mortgage mutual fund and somebody defaults, we'll just foreclose, we'll have to pay some costs of foreclosing, then we'll sell the property. That'll be money in, we'll give it, give it to the shareholders. That's how a closed end fund would work. And an open end fund, you guys all have, uh, certainly all, I'm sure that almost all of you have uh, mutual funds where you own some shares of stock. And you know, if the stock market drops today, your mutual funds drop in value, but um, the uh, mutual fund company itself, the fund itself uh, doesn't uh, suffer any, uh, uh, any liability. The fact that the investments that it's invested in go south doesn't mean that that mutual fund itself is in any danger of going under, of failing. So the only mutual funds that failed uh, during the Great Recession uh, were the uh, money market funds that were back to the buck. They said, you give us your money. We promised for sure to pay you at least a buck for every buck you give us. And um, the, uh, the largest and oldest uh, money market fund, I forget the name of it now, um, uh, anyway, uh, they actually broke the buck and uh, the government had to come in and uh, provide insurance. Uh, they sent a fax uh, to all the mutual funds and within 15 minutes, we had the uh, federal government insuring $3 trillion worth of money market funds. And uh, they insured, of course, at about $3 trillion of FDIC liabilities. Then there was about $6 trillion of cash surrender value policies that um, where the insurance companies had the ability to, uh, to wait, to hold off surrendering the cash in exchange for, you could take in your, your uh, whole life insurance policy and say, I want cash back for it. That's part of my policy. And that is like presenting uh, your check to your bank and saying, I want cash back for my checking account. And we had about $6 trillion there. So had there been a run on these, um, on these uh, life insurance companies, we would have seen the federal government on the hook for pretty much overnight, $12 trillion. And that would have led 
everybody to think, well, gee, the federal government is going to be printing $12 trillion. The money supply is not nearly that big. We're going to have hyperinflation. And uh, if we have hyperinflation and we have money in our banking accounts and we don't run to get the money out, by the time we get the money out and buy some IKEA furniture, the furniture is going to be worth a zillion bucks uh, per chair. And therefore, we're going to lose all the value of our money. So what I'm saying is that we had several levels of layers of, um, of mobile equilibria here. We had the, the public, the banks trusting the banks and the banks lost trust in the banks, so they ran on the banks. And then the public could have run on the Federal Reserve. It could have said, hey, look, we understand that um, you guys have uh, promised to uh, defend these deposits, but if we look at the FDIC reserves, you've got no money there. Uh, to, so you're gonna have to print money and therefore we don't trust your promise. Therefore, we're gonna run to get our money out and uh, we're gonna run to get our money market money out too, despite your facts. And we're gonna run to get our life insurance money out. We're gonna surrender our cash surrender value policies. And that's another self-fulfilling equilibrium that could have brought down the entire financial system. So I'm saying to myself, how do you build a financial system where you can have uh, the intermediaries go under? Well, again, you look at the, the, um, the non-leveraged part of the financial system, which were the uh, equity finance mutual funds, and like the Windsor Fund of, of Vanguard, well, the value of their assets went down, the value of their shareholders' uh, ownership of these assets went down, but the Windsor Fund didn't go bankrupt. They had no possibility of going bankrupt. They had no liabilities. So I'm talking about making every financial institution, every, every corporation that is chartered as a financial institution uh, run on the basis of um, being a equity finance mutual fund, either an open-end fund or a closed-end fund, and uh, the type, type I've described, where the only way they take in money, not by leverage, not by we will pay you back uh, by this date under these circumstances, and it might be immediately de on, de on demand as in, in, in a demand deposit, but we will but you own a share to the pool of assets we've taken in under, uh, under this mutual fund. And uh, you've got a claim to the value of the investments that we do with the money that you give us. So for example, if you wanna have a checking account, you would have a cash mutual fund where you would take in the money, you would uh, give us money, we would uh, uh, take that money and put it on reserve with the Federal Reserve in effect, you'd have an account with the Federal Reserve. And if you wanted to get your money out, you would just come cash in your shares and we would just cash out those assets, meaning we'd just take the money back from the Federal Reserve and hand you back your money. And uh, this is uh, how we would, this would replace the checking accounts that we now have. Everybody would have a cash mutual fund account and uh, by the way, the name cash mutual fund is not one I invented. Fidelity has a cash mutual fund as far as I know. And you can use, um, what I have in mind is, you know, you could use a, write a check on that fund or you could, you know, use a debit card or use an ATM, a card that you could use at the ATM to get cash. It would just operate as if, as uh, Irving Fisher was proposing back when he wrote his um, book, I think it's called One, uh, one money or something uh, to that nature, where he was advocating another um, economist in, uh, under the Chicago plan, they were advocating fixing the whole financial system by having cash mutual funds. But what I'm talking about goes well, well beyond, far beyond cash mutual funds. I'm talking about <clears throat> making the entire financial system an equity finance uh, mutual fund system so that it can never fail. So imagine that, you know, we had no failures. Uh, we had about 25% of the financial system 
back in 2008 were uh, Fidelity funds or T. Rowe Price funds or mutual funds that were equity finance or Vanguard funds. None of them failed, not a single one. And what do we do with the um, Dodd-Frank uh, bill? What we did is we rebuilt the system just pretty much the way it was. Uh, we uh, looked at all these, um, you know, uh, buildings were made out of straw. They had all collapsed. The ones that were built out of brick hadn't collapsed or had been a hurricane. And what we decided to do was rebuild everything out of straw. Uh, I mean, we didn't outlaw the, the buildings out of cat out of out of um, brick, but we did outlaw all the ones. Well, we did um, basically uh, bail out. Uh, equity, uh, sorry, uh, leveraged um, financial institutions so that they could live another day. We got rid of some of their management, but um, they're still operating the same way they were. And we're having, of course, these stress tests, but the stress tests, I think, are pretty much of a joke because if you ask, could Lehman or Bear Stearns or many of these other companies that went under in 2008 have passed the stress test that is now being applied, could they have passed them back in uh, 2008? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, the, uh, I mean, that's the statement of uh, Christopher Cox, who was the head of the SEC. That's not my statement. But if you look at the facts of what actually was going on in 2008, there's a paper on my, on my website, both under uh, the, sec if you go to kotlikoff.net, you'll come to my website. And there's a, a paper called The Big Con, which is um, under articles. And then there's uh, something similar called The Big Con under columns. And what I'm, then that's like a shorter version, but uh, none of these papers have any mathematics in them. They're just looking at what actually happened in 2008 and looking at it from a historic perspective uh, based on data that has been collected and analyzed by economists since 2008, we now know that uh, subprime mortgages were far too, the liar loans, no doc loans and angel loans, they were far too small to um, have brought down the mortgage market, let alone the entire financial system, uh, even if they'd all been bad. But it turns out uh, that they weren't bad. It turns out that these were pretty good securities and it turns out that they were properly rated and that where we actually had problems with the mortgage market was not in the subprimes, but in the regular mortgages that were not subprimes. Uh, they were the ones that lost the most value. The 32 billion or so, 31 billion of uh, crap, uh, uh, Bear Stearns mortgages uh, that were uh, called the Maiden Lane uh, Fund that the Fed uh, spent um, bought this money to get JP Morgan, bought these subprimes so that JP Morgan could buy up J um, Bear Stearns at $2 a share. And, and by the way, uh, Maiden Lane is the, at the rear end of the Federal Reserve Bank of, of New York. That's why it was called uh, Maiden Lane because it was like the excrement of the financial system. That's why they called it uh, the uh, Maiden Lane Fund. So these terrible securities, supposedly terrible securities, they turned a profit. As um, uh, Tim Geithner is proud of, of telling everybody, if you ask him, he'll say, look, uh, we made a good investment. No, Tim, you didn't make a good investment. What you got was you were in the middle of a financial panic where everybody thought everything, everybody was acting on misinformation about what was really going on, what the true value of these securities and liabilities were. And we had a, a panic uh, that was reinforced by the politicians and the press. But in point of fact, we didn't have uh, uh, subprimes that were significant enough to bring down the financial system. We didn't have uh, uh, misrating of securities on a systematic basis. We didn't have the leverage that Bear Stearns had in 2008 was less than it had 10 years before. Uh, same thing with Lehman, I believe. It's in the, it's in the paper, the big con. Uh, the companies that were more leveraged than they were 10 years earlier were JP Morgan and um, Goldman. And they didn't go under uh, because 
people had confidence in them. Uh, and they knew that uh, somehow that the Fed wouldn't let them go under. So almost everything that the everything that the federal the financial crisis inquiry commission wrote about the causes of the um, great recession, the idea that housing prices were out the wazoo, not true. If you look at the data, the ratio of housing prices to GDP, um, or some value of the stock of housing to GDP, was uh, you know. Uh, it was housing prices had gone up more rapidly than they had in the past, but for many, many decades, they hadn't kept uh, even with prices. The real price of housing was declining and then they went up for a couple of years, but it wasn't like they were, this was uh, the tulip bubble uh, in housing. And it's not like we have a tulip bubble in housing today around the country either. This is, uh, uh, you know, somebody's writing some, some article to get published, but it's not necessarily based on, on, the, on the data, on the true facts. And back in 2008, we didn't know the facts, but we do now. So what I'm saying is that the entire Great Recession was A, not great. It was a minor, it was a medium-sized recession. It wasn't uh, the 1909 recession, wasn't the Great Depression by any, by a mile. So that was misnamed and all the causes were not true. So what was true is that we had opacity and leverage and we had a, a vital public good that people were worried and we had multiple equilibria. So if you wanna get rid of all these problems, you go to mutual fund banking, which is equity fi finance mutual fund banking and uh, you have closed and open-end funds. And by the way, it operates very much like Islamic banking should operate, but it doesn't. And then you set a, um, a boundary, you say, look, if you're going to operate as a non-financial corporation, you can't borrow money and then lend it to some third party. Uh, if you want to borrow money to invest in, in your um, capital, uh, you do that. Otherwise, you hold cash and cash mutual funds, but you can't, in effect, become a shadow bank under um, the uh, uh, system of limited purpose banking. Now, what we're seeing in the um, advent, uh, advent of uh, cryptocurrencies is uh, to some extent what I'm pushing for in limited purpose banking. Because if you think about uh, investing in Bitcoin, we're talking about uh, you have shares of Bitcoin and Bitcoin is a currency. So that's like a cash mutual fund. Uh, that's like, except that Bitcoin doesn't have a stable value relative to the dollar. Uh, and there are like a thousand different cryptocurrencies. So, but the, the essence of the idea that you, that your uh, money is there, you're holding, you're holding um, transaction uh, balances and that uh, they're not in a non-leveraged institution, that's there. That's exactly what a cash mutual fund is under in the book, Limited Purpose Banking, you know, Jimmy Stewart is dead. Now, if you think about uh, blockchain uh, transactions, peer-to-peer uh, -peer investing, well, that's very much uh, like uh, uh, a, a closed-end mutual fund. I mean, you're, you're investing, if a bunch of people are investing collectively in, uh, in some mortgage fund that is buying uh, funding mortgages and it's being facilitated through bot blockchain as opposed to some bank, um, that's, um, that's, a cat, that's a closed end mutual fund, uh, equity finance, there's no leverage. The system, the financial system uh, can't, go on, can't go under the, the uh, it's not like um, if these houses lose value and the, and the people that owe the mortgages can't repay them or they lose their jobs. Uh, well, uh, the blockchain will, 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 chain will, will indicate that you've lost uh, value uh, in your security, but it's not like the blockchain itself will go under or will go financially bankrupt. It's a, you know, it's a computer system, it can't go under. So, what I'm saying is that we do have a way to make the financial system safe. 
you know, let me just, um, I know I've gone a little bit beyond, but let me just spend five minutes talking about all, all this in the connection to money because you're the American Monetary Institute. And uh, does, uh, does any of this have anything to do with, with money? Well, uh, sir, I think, you know, you know money is a, a financial asset. It's also a, a means of engaging in transactions. And we're using, we have over the years uh, facilitated our transactions in many different ways during the Great Recession, sorry, during the Great Depression, you'll be interested to know that there were something like 3,000 currencies that were issued by state and local governments, well, basically local governments would issue currencies that um, were transacting, uh, were being used to, um, uh, as like bills of exchange. Uh, certain towns had, um, had pieces of bark uh, from a, from a you know, maybe a favorite tree where they would write the town's name and redeemable and at some date in gold coin or whatever. Uh, and that was circulating as money in that town. So you had, um, and of course, during the colonial period and after the, after the revolution, we had all kinds of currencies. Um, people were writing their own, their own currency. So the idea of, um, so money is really whatever anybody thinks it is, whatever, whatever somebody will take as a, you know, in swap for something maybe of real physical value, like a chicken, uh, maybe I can take a piece of pizza and swap it. And then you can take that piece of pizza and swap it. You, you sell me the chicken for the pizza and then you swap the pizza for some apples. And, but you can see that pizza is not a particularly good store of value, medium of exchange, uh, unit of account, because you, you know pizza comes in different sizes. So it's not a very good, but there's nothing that says that pizza can't at some level serve as money. So the notion of what is money is not something that economists have a well-defined, is a clear, clearly defined uh, measure. So we have things that are uh, being used to effect transactions, and that's changing all the time. We now have credit cards that we didn't have 50 years ago to um, engage in transactions. And uh, we don't need as much, uh, you know, these dollar bills, we don't need them to the extent we did in the past to effect transactions. So uh, I think the issue with, with uh, money is whether these different forms of money are gonna retain value or they're gonna be uh, easily converted and um, dependably converted into a chicken, you know, that you'll be able to take this number of seashells or this number of pieces of, pay of pizza or this number of Confederate um, dollar bills or this number of continental continentals and swap them for a chicken. If, if you can't, uh, there's some problem with that uh, medium of, you know, that medium of exchange. Uh, the, um, the ability of that, of that institution uh, to help us with our transactions is dissipated. And, you know, with, with cryptocurrencies, we have like a thousand of these things. They, they're, they're, uh, their ability to help us buy chickens is uh, quite suspect, whether we'll be able to buy uh, a fixed number of chickens for a fixed number of Bitcoins 10 years from now is very unlikely because we know that Bitcoins is fluctuating dramatically relative to the price of, to the, in terms of how many chickens you need to buy, um, to buy a Bitcoin or how many Bitcoins will swap for, for a chicken. Now, when we're talking about the US dollar, which is the last thing I'll talk about, and the fact that the Federal Reserve has printed, uh, you know, has a balance sheet that they've expanded dramatically. Uh, and as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a, a, the balance sheet is six times bigger in the sense that the, uh, that the um, uh, base money is six times bigger than it was back in 2008. Uh, and um, so then the question is, how much of this represents portfolio 
transactions uh, by the Federal Reserve and how much of it is the Federal Reserve just printing money to buy chickens for the president for lunch. Um, I'm presuming he, he likes chickens, I don't, I don't know, for, but let's, let's assume that's the case. So, you know, it turns out that that's a pretty hard thing to figure out because uh, the Federal Reserve has um, an ability to print money uh, to, you know, I can, I, if I'm the Federal Reserve chairman, I can buy your security, which may, may be, uh, you know, a rather, um, uh, you know, security that's got a, a rather um, limited market, and not, and not a uh, uh, particularly uh, liquid uh, security, rather liquid, I could pay you 10 times what it's worth and buy up your security. So if I'm buying up corporate bonds or mortgages, which is what the Federal Reserve has been doing of late, uh, I could be paying far beyond what the value of your, what this, you know, your promise to repay, I could be, uh, if I'm, you know, giving you this money at such a low interest rate, where these, where the real interest rates right now are negative, you could argue that I'm just, in effect, printing money to make a transfer payment to you, the mortgagee, or I'm printing money to make a transfer payment to the corporate uh, bond uh, issuer, or I'm printing money to uh, to buy bonds for Uncle Sam at a, at a um, at a price that's far too high compared to what it sh it should be. So the Federal Reserve uh, has, you know, obviously it can monetize the debt, so the Treasury can sell debt to the public, take back chickens, uh, buy you know, take back money, buy use the money to buy the chickens. Chickens comes back to the White House. And now the same amount of money is out there, but then we've got more federal orange bonds, treasury bonds that the Fed then prints green piece of paper to buy the orange pieces of, of bonds. And the bond, and and now that's a case of pure monetary, you know, monetary finance, where the federal government, if you'll combine the treasury and the Federal Reserve together, they've just printed green piece of paper to buy chickens. That's your traditional concern. But the Fed has all kinds of abilities to, in effect, buy chickens for or make transfer payments to different entities using uh, in, in, the, in the form of buying and selling securities that, um, that makes it uh, essentially impossible to figure out how much of what the Federal Reserve is up to is really uh, just printing money to or electronically printing money, if you like, to um, pay for what the government is spending. And that could be buying chickens or making transfer payments to corporations to keep them afloat during a pandemic or giving money to uh, households, in effect, uh, that are uh, in trouble on their mortgages. So uh, let me stop there and just say that um, uh, we, we need to have, let me just finally, finally kind of say that you need to have uh, a financial, a, a fiscal system that is sustainable to make sure that the monetary system is not engaged in printing a lot of money, either directly or indirectly, to uh, cover the, uh, the rear end of the treasury. And we have a, fin a fiscal system that is highly unsustainable. We have a huge amount of unfunded liabilities that go well beyond uh, about seven times the amount of the official debt. So our country is as broke as broke could be and broke countries end up running inflations. And we're now running an inflation. And do we have the potential to run a hyperinflation? Uh, we do, I think we do. Uh, if you look at the fiscal side and you put two and two together, I think you have that and I think this also becomes a matter of multiple equilibria and confidence in the dollar and, uh, and the US economy and our ability to stay even with China, which is likely to be twice as big as our economy, if not bigger by the end of the century when you look at the projections. So um, let me stop there. I think I've, I've given you some food for thought. 
And uh, this is all coming from somebody who knows nothing about this topic. So just so you know, um, just- um, No, you know, thank you. They paid to, to, to learn public finance if you want to learn about, uh, about money. Uh, the echo, we're still <laughs> working on that. Um, yeah, I don't, I can, I can look here. We're fine. Okay. Um, at this moment, I hope everybody can hear me, though I am unmuted. I'm using the uh, microphone uh, from Stephen, who is sitting next to me. Um, first of all, uh, Professor Kotlikov, very uh, uh, much thanks for um, sure. getting this message out. I think a lot of items resonated with many of us uh, who have done some uh, homework here on, on monetary reform. Uh, especially the idea that banks um, should only be intermediaries and, and not create the money supply themselves. And that's one of the strong points that the American Monetary Institute is, is promoting. Um, even Stephen Sarlenga, who was its founder uh, 25 years ago, uh, was involved in developing legislation uh, to that effect in the NEED Act um, in 2012. And you mentioned the Chicago plan. So yes, that, that, that idea went to the, uh, or it's kind of based on the Chicago plan. Yeah. At the same time also, and this is one of the reasons that we invited you, because um, uh, I became aware that you were one of the co-authors in, in some of the uh, anthologies that Yuli Korch uh, created. And you also went all the way in 2018 to Switzerland. Um, to defend more or less their proposal to change their money system, the, the Volgeld uh, uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. So I think in many ways we are uh, overlapping in, in our concerns, in our proposals and in our, um, well, maybe not necessarily legislation. So one of the things that I'm interested in is if you would put your proposal into a legislative uh, uh, proposal, how would that look like? Um, and or are you still um, um, behind this, this full belt initiative uh, that, that can be duplicated again because the Swiss can, can have another referendum in a couple of years uh, about right. this? And the American Monetary Institute and its sister organization, the Alliance for Just Money, is working on a, let's say, updated version of the Need Act um, to get to the same result here in the United States. Um, do you have any um, ideas in that direction, or should that be for the, you know, the tinkerers <laughs> in the legislative branch um, to figure that one out, as long as they understand what it is about, because that's also one of the problems, of course, that a lot of politicians and even economists are not necessarily knowing that most of the money supply is created by banks, and that's one of the big problems um, of our economy. Could you address that, the legislative and maybe also the ignorance uh, that's still out there? Right. Well, okay. So. Uh... So in the in the book I wrote that the very easy way to implement the um, limited purpose banking is to say that every financial um, every financial um, corporation has to reorganize itself as a, um, a mutual fund holding company, and they have to issue mutual funds, and that um, through time their balance sheet uh, has to be uh, uh, they have to uh, be issuing more and more mutual funds and less and less uh, uh, engaged and less and less leveraged uh, so that over time they end up with uh, like over 10 years end up with um, just being a mutual fund holding company that's equity financed. And so, uh, so what I'm saying is that limited purpose banking incorporates uh, uh, cash mutual funds, which are, is the full geld uh, proposal, and is the Irving Fishing, Irving Fisher, uh, Chicago plan, but but that the problem runs much deeper than just um, uh, our deposits going into a uh, uh, a checking account and then being lent out 
uh, or even being multiplied uh, through the banking system. And, and that um, the, re the real problem is we have, if it goes beyond that, I mean, that's, uh, that is a problem and limited purpose banking deals with it, but we have much, but that would not solve the whole problem. If we had um, everybody back in 2008, let's take the extreme that everybody had a bank account, a checking account with this Federal Reserve system, okay? It just had a, a, a you know, and, and if you go back to the last century, I believe, or the century before, well, I think I think in the early days of the Federal Reserve, they actually had uh, took in checking accounts that you could have a checking account with the Federal Reserve. But let's suppose everybody did back in 2008, would we not have had a financial crisis? We would have. And what I'm trying to do is uh, su suggest that we need to have uh, the, these financial intermediaries, intermediaries, these gas stations not be leveraged so that uh, we can have a Bear Stearns taking money uh, in, a, let's say, a brokerage account, lend it out or, or uh, invest in risky ways, and then owe money to the, um, to the people that have given, you know, put money into their brokerage account, uh, thinking that that money was was safe and was going to come back to them because then there's going to be a run on Bear Stearns. And we don't want these financial middlemen uh, who are connecting uh, lenders with borrowers uh, and savers with investors, these financial inter inter interplayers uh, from um, going under. They have a job to do and we want to preserve that job. So. So I'm all for full gelb, but I, what I said at that uh, conference that Yuri uh, uh, held um, is that, um, uh, that this is just part of the way, you know, a small part of the way towards limited purpose banking and that we need to go the whole way because we would still have the same kind of vulnerability. Uh, now you're on to a, kind of a different issue, which is banks uh, uh, creating money uh, to um, uh, you know, basically uh, issuing uh, loans and uh, uh, creating money in that context. Uh, now, banks would not be able to issue loans under limited purpose banking. They, there wouldn't be any loans from uh, the uh, people. I mean, if you if you're borrowing money. To buy, to buy a house or to, uh, to have, to buy a car or to um, take out a student loan, you would do it through a closed end mutual fund uh, that was uh, financing your, uh, your, uh, your particular loan. You wouldn't be uh, uh, lending money to a bank or the bank wouldn't be, the intermediary would not be borrowing from you it's only the, the final end household or non-financial institution that would be borrowing. So uh, limited purpose banking shuts down what you're concerned about. There's no question um, that it does that. And the other thing I wanna make clear is that limited purpose banking has disclosure by a government agency of all the securities that the mutual funds, these equity finance mutual funds are holding. If we're talking about T. Rowe Price having an equity fund, we, we should be able to go online and see what securities it holds. And if it's holding a, a mortgage mutual fund, we should be able to drill down to the level of, let's say a mile to ask, okay, here's a particular mortgage. It's, um, and here's the last time we verified the guy who has that mortgage actually has a job and is earning this much money and um, has this much in assets. And so that we can see exactly what the value of this um, of these mutual funds that we uh, own are, so that there was would be a secondary market, we'd have much more liquidity. So I'm thinking that the financial system would work a whole hell of a lot better because we would have transparency. I started out talking about opacity, but I talk in the book about there being a um, a federal financial um, uh, authority that would. Um, would verify uh, 
and disclose online in real time on an ongoing basis, the value of all the securities held by these uh, equity finance mutual funds. So we wouldn't be relying on um, uh, the guy um, who was running Countrywide Financial, uh, Mozilla. Mozilla was this guy, guy's name? Mm -hmm. uh, here, he, here we got this guy, we're relying on him to determine whether or not uh, this mortgage that he's writing is an honest mortgage. Whether this guy lied about the value of his home, whether he lied about his job. So if Anthony Mazzillo writing a mortgage to you, Govert, and I over here am supposed to, I'm buying shares of, of Countrywide Financial, I'm investing in country, maybe I'm buying bonds, and uh, maybe I'm even buying uh, that security that they are selling to me on you. And I'm relying on Anthony Mozillo's hired hand yeah. who might be hired to lie yeah. about or let you take a pass um, and pretend that your house is worth three times what it is and that you actually have a job. So why don't we have the federal government verify your mortgage? because they have the records that you're actually employed. They have the tax records, right? The FICA tax records. Uh, they can send out independent appraisers to appraise your house that you're trying to buy, that you're trying to borrow against. We can have all, the, all this verification it has to be done anyway. Let's have it done by somebody we actually trust, which is Uncle Sam, by, uh, by people that don't have any vested interest in lying about your ability to repay. So that's why the you know part of the proposal is it's two parts. It's this verification by the federal government, and it's also a non-leveraged financial system, an equity finance mutual fund system. But absolutely for sure, um, we would have um, uh, a uh, the Chicago plan as part of this. We'd have people have in effect um, cash mutual funds in effect accounts with the Federal Reserve. And, uh, and we would have uh, uh, the inability to, you know, if I'm a bank and I'm issuing you a loan, um, now I've, um, uh, I'm taking in a deposit and I owe you money back. That's what we have is this money supply creation that you guys are worried about. Okay. Now I have an IOU and I also have an asset. I've got a loan on you, that's an asset. I have an obligation, an IOU to pay you back that checking account that I've just set up for you. I've, I created money out of thin air. That would not be allowed under limited purpose banking because I would be then leveraged. There's no leverage in under limited purpose banking, zero leverage. So that's what I think you guys- That's, that's good to hear. That's, that's really good to hear. Um, on zero leverage is the real are, issue. Are you, uh, we have three questions. I, I know. Are you unmuted? Yes. I, okay. Um, I assume you still can hear me. I'm not muted again. I'm using someone else's uh, uh, microphone here. Um, but with your last statement, I'm, I'm very glad that indeed banks uh, will become intermediaries. I'm, of course, still interested that if anybody is working on legislation, uh, so it can be compared with uh, the Chicago plan and the Need Act and the Volgeld and wherever else uh, these items are developed. Um, but I'd like to go to the uh, question uh, part. And I think that um, Mr. Kokobian is the first, first one. one. Carol. Carol Brule is first. Or Carol Brule is the first. So let's let's hear Carol Brule and her question. Unmute. Have to unmute Carol. Sorry about that. I appreciate your unique uh, viewpoint on what's going on and your uh, experience with the Fed. I'm reminded of when we had the last. Uh, economic crisis and somebody spoke at one of the monetary re uh, reform conferences about control fraud and the best way to rob a bank was to own one and I think we're seeing that uh, a lot of faith and trust in the United States government has completely diminished, especially in light of the fact that the Fed has dumped so many trillions of dollars into the economy 
and it's all been sucked up to the very wealthiest people. And at the same time, we've seen the largest financial crime, I'd say, in uh, this century with the transference of wealth from the many to the few. And especially with right now, people are forced to take these illegal um, injections, which uh, violate international law or they're forced to lose their jobs. So we're really in a crisis period. And I know I'm, I'm out in the streets organizing rallies and there's supposed to be a nationwide shutdown next week um, to close down you know, transportation, all sorts of things that, to try to stop these tyrannical measures. So <laughs> I would say from, from my unique point of view, I see that this is moving us towards a central bank digital currency and a surveillance state, a complete police state, and that most people are completely opposed to that. Uh, and that I, I don't see how uh, we could we could have any trust in the government to move forward with controlling every aspect of the issuance of currency and also being able to programming it so that some people will starve and some people will be able to eat. <laughs> you raise a lot of issues that go kind of go beyond um, just the financial system and and the and what is money and and how do we keep um, you know, the value of money stable and and um, and keep the economy out of recession. Uh, you know, you're talking about the surveillance state. You're talking about um, uh, inequality in society. There, there's a, I think, an interesting paper, Kotlikop.net. If you search under articles for inequality, I think inequality is actually um, greatly overstated because we are leaving out the whole fiscal side, which is. Uh, engaged in this big business of trying to equalize uh, resources. We also have a lot of, you know, in the process of taxing uh, people and making benefit payments to them, which we then take away when they earn too much money, we're putting uh, huge fractions of the poor into extremely high marginal tax rates uh, brackets to the point where they have no incentive to work. So, so you're going to hear uh, some things if you read my stuff, which is pretty readable. Um, you'll you'll hear some things that are somewhat contradictory. Things are less unequal than, let's say, uh, uh, somebody like a uh, Emmanuel Saez, who is an economist at Berkeley, would argue because he's just looking at wealth. He's not looking at human wealth, which is labor income, which is much more equally distributed, let alone the fiscal system, which is much more. Which where the where the rich are paying most of the taxes in the country, um, but he's also not looking at the fact, um, you know, you you focus on inequality, and I think one of the deep concerns about inequality is if you lock the poor into poverty by saying to them, look, um, if you earn money, you're going to lose uh, seventy cents on the dollar or more, in either in the form of higher taxes or lower benefits, then you've you've got a system that's in terrible shape because you're perpetuating poverty forever. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is, is get, to the, um, get to these deeper um, understandings. Of, because, and it's not easy. It's not easy to see what the Fed's actually up to, which you kind of pointed to. And I'm not saying I have, I tried to allude to that, that I could that I have a crystal ball that I could measure. Uh, but I, what I can measure is the fiscal solvency of the country that the present value of the taxes cannot cover the present value of the obligations that we've made by miles. And that long-term fiscal gap is just enormous. And I've written about that. And that leads you to, um, that, and that shows you then the pressure on the Fed to start using um, the printing press as a source of fiscal power, uh, as a fiscal solution. And that leads, you know, generally to inflation, which we're starting to see. So, but is this inflation due to supply side bottlenecks, or is it due to people realizing the Fed is, you know, the country's broke and in trouble? But we have these other deeper issues, which is we do have inequality. We have terrible inequality in labor income because of a terrible educational system, and we have a terrible inequality because of we're locking the poor into poverty because they're in such high marginal tax brackets. So we have to fix, we have to look at some of these more fundamental things. There's a book at um, kotlikoff.net 
It's called You're Hired, which um, is a free download book. Uh, and you can download it and it shows you what I would, uh, if I had been elected president in 2016, what I would have done, what I would have proposed to we do. Very different from anything that Trump uh, would be doing right now or anything that Biden is doing right now. Although I think a lot of what Biden is doing is, uh, is needed, but we need to pay for everything we're spending and more where we've already spent or we're already obligated in a way that doesn't put people in a super high tax bracket. So we need a whole new tax system. We need a whole new education system that leverages uh, in the internet. The fact that you can teach poor kids with the same excellent teachers that you can teach rich kids uh, for free. We should be having global universal education uh, every day, half the day, kids should be learning from the same, the same curriculum, the same, the same teachers all around the world, all around the country in the poorest neighborhoods. They should be given pods with headphones and uh, be you know, getting the same education. And we have equality of education and we have a class size of one because the teacher is going around to the pod and now we're going from a class size of 30, 30 down to a class size of one. So there's lots of things we can do to fix this country. This country's got deep problems. They're not all connected to the Fed. They're not all connected to, and you know, the, the I think it's- uh, Thanks for a couple of things, if I may uh, interfere here. Uh, before we start solving all the problems, <laughs> yeah. we're we to paper off. Um, I, I like to uh, go on with the next question and, and thank you for your homework. Uh, and I hope we find the link and I will share that with the participants. Okay, sure. Um, next in line is Mr. Peshva Kokobian. Uh, Peshva, unmute yourself. Uh. And, and then we'll get also to uh, in my line. Uh, Ron Phillips. Phillips. Yeah. And um, John and Marie. Um, okay. So I'm probably going to have to uh, say goodbye at the, head, at the end of the hour. But anyway, let's. Oh, uh, you know, absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're aiming, you know, officially at uh, 545. Uh, but we might go a little bit over that. Okay, good. Um, okay. I'll try and be quick. It's hard for a professor to, to shut up. But anyway, uh, go ahead, sir. All right. Right, Mike, go ahead. Uh -huh. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Professor Kotlikov. Uh, I appreciate uh, for your insight. Actually, I do. Uh, I do have uh, two kind of a question regarding what you just mentioned and re reference to Erwin uh, Fisher and the, the some kind of a parallel or complementary currency. And as you may know, in after the the the, the big crash, uh, almost close to 3,200 complementary currency or parallel currency, local currency were introduced in the US. So it seems to us that the way we are going moving forward, it's either decentralization of the money or the centralization of money, but it seems to us uh, that the authorities, they have taken the centralization, but the new face, which is a digital digital currency, digital uh, central bank currency. So I want to, ask you this question. Do you think according, I want to refer, uh, refer to the um, analogy of Dr. John Titus, uh, the bank circuit and, uh, and the retail circuit, which I call it the labor circuit. Do you think that as you mentioned about the cryptocurrency and stuff, do you think if we, if we don't go to the central road, which is the centralization of money, but decentralization, do you think we have to separate the, the 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 bank money circuit and the retail money circuit and implement in some some form of like for example for example because you said we need to change tax format so instead of touching that tax format let's have each state for example in US have their own currency let's say uh, Texas dollar or Arizona dollar okay and they include the tax whatever, uh, tax discount in that format, and then go that way instead of going to the decentralization because that's a difference, totally different story. So my, my question is that which way should we go? And if we go, which kind of a strategy or tactic has to be taken? 
Well, I think, um, you know, in the, in the end, what we're trying to do is get a, um, a system where we can figure out what the relative price of an apple and an orange is. How many apples will swap for an orange? That's basically what an economist would say. You know, our models um, don't start with money. That money is like an illusion. It's just, um, we don't know, we don't even know what it is. You know, our mathematics uh, basically doesn't have money. We have to kind of come up with hokey ways to introduce it. Uh, so we're, talk we're talking about swap rates, prices, relative prices. And are we gonna have, uh, you know, clearer relative prices, uh, more stable relative prices uh, with a zillion currencies. As you said, there were like 3,000 after <laughs> during the Great Depression. And we've got 1,000 cryptocurrencies now. Uh, is that going to help us versus having uh, just one, uh, one currency that helps us, uh, maybe one global currency? We kind of have that now with the dollar. Uh, uh, to help us uh, figure out the relative prices or will we end up in a situation where we don't have any currencies where we just have everything denominated in kind of units of chickens i mean uh where who can we you can imagine that kind of a world too where everything is people get paid in chickens or uh, uh but uh, you know if they get paid more chickens than there actually are chickens then you've got uh, you're kind of get back in the same uh, boat uh, that, of, of the problem here that uh, the financial system is, is kind of leveraged and, and uh, uh, is promising to do something it can't deliver in certain states of the world. So um, yeah, I think, I think we're kind of toying with uh, this decentralization money like we, and people are not familiar with the history of it, but it, it didn't end well. It didn't, we didn't, we don't have the ability to have a zillion different currencies be stable through time. We don't, we don't see that. And, um, you know, um, the, and it, the Euro may not end up, um, uh, you know, surviving given the way they've got, um, although I think if they went to limited purpose banking, they could have separate fiscal policies and that they would actually survive as a, as a currency. So, um, well, so I just want to kind of punt on this question. I think that basically we, um, lots and lots of currencies is, is unstable for the relative price of apples versus oranges. And um, so that's not likely to survive. Whether or not we have, you know, end up with one world currency or a handful of currencies basically, which is what we have now or no currencies. Uh, what we really care about is, uh, a system where people can tell what an apple will exchange for for an orange, because if they don't know, they're not going to be able to make that deal. And we want people to make deals. So that's what the this you know what we need money for to help us make uh, clear what the relative prices are. And I'm not sure exactly where things are heading on that score right now. Yeah, I uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, more research about that. How stable uh, multi. Uh, a system with multiple currencies would be. Um, we're going to Ron Phillips, who uh, we many of us know, and maybe uh, Professor Kotlikov too, is an expert on the Chicago plan. So I'm looking forward to his question. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kotlikov. I certainly enjoyed your book, and I am highly sympathetic, of course, with your limited uh, service banking. Uh, what I want to ask you about when I think about the Chicago plan and this whole issue is Henry Simons, who was the original formulator of all these ideas, <clears throat> he had a notion of the financial good society. And his notion of the financial good society was the following. First of all, all money would be fiat money issued essentially by the treasury. He wanted to collapse the treasury and the central bank into one, and they would uh, create that fiat money on the basis of uh, a rule, a monetary rule that would that they would then use the price level as sort of a target how to adjust that rule. He would abolish the that that would take care of the monetary the money and the payment system. He would then abolish all short term debt, all debt, public, private, whatever would be 
essentially infinite maturity consoles. So that was his financial good society. Uh, it's essentially with, with banks with 100% reserves, uh, the banks would not be able to create any money. It's, it's in effect, everyone would have, it's like today's being proposed, everyone have an account at the Federal Reserve that takes care of the payment system. Now, I wanna add to that, what the development that's happening today, we talked about cryptocurrencies, but what about the stable coins? The stable coin circle has this US dollar coin. It is essentially the Chicago plan. It's, 100%, it's back to 100% by safe assets. What do you think of this structure, this idea of, of the financial good society? It seems to fit in very well with your ideas. Well, I think uh, Simon and I would probably agree on mostly everything. You know, uh, consoles, uh, it, it may reduce the uh, potential for runs, but it's still leverage, I think. So I think there's some, we might might differ on that. As coins, yeah, if I own some dollar bills or some coins, I've got, you know, I've got a cash mutual fund right there. <laughs> No reason to put it anywhere. I just have it. And uh, the problem is, uh, will retain value? Well, I mean, that's a separate problem of inflation, but will I, could it be stolen? Could somebody break in my house and steal it? And that's, that's the, the main concern. But yeah, we do yeah. need to have the financial system work for us, not against us, and not be a source of instability. And, and that's basically the idea of limited purpose banking. Um, no. And yeah, and uh, we can do better, no, no question. I, I think the, uh, but I, I do think that if we keep focusing on just on money and, and the banks printing money, and if, I think we have to kind of push to the bigger picture, which is we want to, we want a financial system that never fails. We want it to, it's a public good. It cannot operate by selling gods. It can't be a highway, a, a gas station system. That, so if we start putting that into the, into the brains of the politicians and talking in that, those terms, we might actually get them to do something useful, which is, which is, and in the course of that, we will get to the Chicago plan as part of the no leverage financial system. Right, I, I, I certainly agree with you. And, there, and I think consoles turn out to be the same thing as equity once you have infinite maturity. Um, so I, I certainly uh, uh, agree with uh, agree with all of that. But I, I appreciate your, your comments and your work, and and maybe we'll see the system uh, evolve in, in that direction. Personally, my bottom line is I would like to revoke the bank charters of the top ten financial banks, force them to be equity based institutions, and see what happens. But thank you. I think, I think if you say we want them to be mutual funds, uh, run as as mutual funds. Rather than revoke them, when you say we'll revoke them, it sounds like you're attacking them per se, which is yeah. not what you're really doing. You're saying, I want them to operate as uh, just like Fidelity uh, because right. Fidelity never failed. Look at 2008, yeah. it never failed. Right. <laughs> 17 companies, 27 mutual, uh, regular banks failed around the world. We don't need that again. We want them all to operate like right. Fidelity. Maybe some congressman, maybe Elizabeth Warren will get it into her head. That this may actually make sense, and she could probably bring some Republicans along on that. Uh, yeah, great. I'm glad I got two professors uh, uh, agreeing <laughs> here, and 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 uh, Tardik and another professor, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, to to come on board with that too. Uh, next, I had someone by the name of John um, that was ready there, but I don't know if he's still online here. Lucille can maybe tell me. Otherwise, we go to how are you? Uh, Mary Werner's question, which I think is next. Um, nobody claiming. I, I think there was somebody. Yes, Maria is here. I think. Okay, let's go on. And you can just pose her question. There, there she is. Go ahead, Marie. You have to uh, unmute, Marie. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, just briefly. Uh, thank you, Professor Kostelkoff, for your 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 talk. I just wanted to ask: in your um, in our current system, the banks are creating money by lending, and that money continues to circulate. So, in your system, how would new money be created and entered into the system? 
Well, the Fed would just um, would uh, uh, print money to a certain amount of money would be printed to pay for government spending, uh, and that's how the Fed uh, would, uh, you know, that that's how more money would get into the system. Now, the Fed would also be able to influence interest rates. For example, if they wanted to lower mortgage rates, they could, uh, there's nothing that says the Fed can't go and uh, buy up mortgage mutual funds, uh, not, the, not the funds themselves, I mean, buy shares in the, in the mortgage, in the closed end mortgage mutual funds, and that will lower, give these mutual funds more money to lend, and that will lower the, the interest rate for mortgages. So the Fed will have much more power really because they could intervene uh, in a portfolio manner in every type, different type of mutual fund selectively. Um, so um, in my story, the Fed still has the, the, the power to print some money. We want, you know, some leverage is, some seniorage is not crazy. Uh, we get maybe one, 2% of our revenue from that. So they should, and I agree you know, with the prior commentator that we should have some restrictions on this, but to the extent we can. Um, but then we also want the Fed where some financial market seems to go crazy. It's got, you know, prices or, or the securities are way too high or uh, that means the interest rates are way too low or the other way around. Uh, they should be able to, to help stabilize the financial system in this manner and they would. So, um, uh, so I, yeah, so I think that's, that's my answer to you, <clears throat> that the Fed would have all the ability uh, and more that now has to uh, help keep the economy on an even keel. And I think we should, you know, congratulate the Fed for doing that. I wouldn't have done it the way they did. Uh, I think they spent, it cost us a huge amount of money. Uh, if I were the president back in 2008, just to be clear, uh, I would have, if I were George Bush, I would have gone up to Lehman Brothers the day after it failed, and I would have taken a sledgehammer to the, the building, and I would have shown, hey, this, this looks like a pretty solid building. And then I would have taken one of the guys walking out with his, who had who just been fired, and I would have drawn blood. I said, this guy seems to be alive. And I'd say, look, the building's here, the people are working in the building, they're gonna get a new job in a couple of weeks. Somebody's gonna buy this building, Nothing real has changed this economy. You had to have a president who was like FDR. The only fear to fear here is fear itself. But of course, that's something major to fear because if enough people fear it, you have a meltdown. So, so what they should have done, Bernanke should have been there with a sledgehammer, uh, should have had the treasury secretary um, uh, Paulson there, should have had the president, should have Nancy Pelosi with their sledgehammer. They should have all been there to make concrete to the public that there's nothing there, there. There wasn't, okay. If I can just ask for quickly for a clarification. So um, as I understand it right now, what we call printing money for the Fed printing money, there the money feeds into bank reserves so are you talking about a change where the money actually comes more directly and doesn't have to go through bank reserves? Well, there wouldn't be, you know, um, I mean, banks would have uh, the cash mutual funds, you put in money into, the, into a bank, they would give you back a, a, a basically a credit card, a debit card, and then they would put the money on reserve with the Federal Reserve. So you'd have an effective, an account with the Federal Reserve. We don't even need the banks for this. We just have the Fed allow people to have accounts directly with the Federal Reserve. And then the banks don't have to be in that business of issuing cash mutual funds. So I'm saying that's not the big problem. The big problem is the leverage uh, that goes well beyond uh, the uh, these checking accounts, the, Fed, the, the, the liability of the banking system with respect to checking accounts. They have lots more liabilities. Uh, they issue bonds. Uh, they are um, leveraged in lots of ways. And it's that leverage which is leading to the instability. 
we don't want to I that. think um, for time's sake, <laughs> unless yes. uh, you have still, uh, I, I think you uh, expect our basic ideas there. And, and again, I, I recommend people indeed, the Jimmy Stewart is dead book it was an easy, very informative read about the, uh, the crisis. Uh, we'll gather some of the, um, uh, the links and the papers that you uh, recommended so people can uh, deepen their understanding uh, of your position. And we might get back to you, you know, to provide more that we can share uh, with the participants of this okay. Uh, conference. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you very heartily uh, for opening this conference. Uh, and um, yeah, you seem to be on the optimistic side, I hope. <laughs> Mm -hmm. that we can change this this uh, system for good because as you said you know it takes maybe 15 minutes for congress to uh, come up with a bill sign it and put it into effect and and that's what we're aiming at at a uh, you know legislation um, that can serve us all right well it's so, yeah, a great pleasure you. thanks so much for having me appreciate it, it it was it was an honor to 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 have you uh, thank you so much if this video is helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe for new video notifications. Please consider donating at monetary.org forward slash donate. Don't forget to check us out on Twitter at AMI Monetary or on our website 